everyone. Uh, I'm Mac McCorkle, Director of Polis, uh, Sanford School Centers uh, Center for Politics. And thank you for joining us tonight for our last event in the, um, uh, of the calendar year of this semester and our final event, Leadership in Politics with the Honorable Sue Gordon. Uh, at Polis, we work to increase the understanding of politics locally, nationally, and globally by permitting, promoting cutting edge politics, research, fostering rich political discourse, new generation of leaders find on ramps to public service. This year, we launched the Polis Innovation Accelerator. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful PhD fellow, Morena Martinez, to say a few words about the Accelerator Initiative and to introduce our moderator. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's talk is the final event of our Fall Innovation Accelerator Speaker Series. Each year, the Innovation Accelerator will offer speaker events and workshops centered around a particular theme. The goal of this accelerator is to encourage people to think up bold policy solutions to today's biggest political problem. This year's theme is justice and citizenship in the time of COVID. This semester, we have hosted illuminating conversations with experts on structural inequality and mail-in voting. Next semester, we will be continuing our speaker series with talks on topics like education during and after COVID-19 and the future of the US healthcare system. Next semester, we will also be hosting a policy pitch competition for undergraduate and graduate level students. Teams of two to four participants will craft policy proposals and present their ideas before a panel of judges. We are welcoming policy proposals related to racial justice, public health, environmental policy, and the future of voting. For more information on the policy pitch competition, upcoming events, and videos of our previous events, please visit our website. You can find us at polis.duke.edu under the Programs tab. For tonight's event, we hope that you'll be thinking of questions you'd like to ask Sue and enter them into the chat box at any time. We'll turn to them during our Q&A segment later in the hour. To kick things off, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Professor DeAndre Rose. Deandra Rose is an assistant professor of public policy and political science at the Stanford School of Public Policy. She's also director for research for the Polis Center of Politics. Her research focuses on US higher education policy, political behavior, American political development, and the politics of inequality. A summa cum laude Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Georgia, Rose received her MA and PhD in government from Cornell University with a specialization in American politics and public policy. Thank you so much, Professor Rose. Thank you so much, Morena, and good evening, everybody. It is an honor to be with you tonight, and we're so grateful that you've joined us for this very special event with the Polis Innovation Accelerator. And it is my honor to introduce our very special guest this evening. The Honorable Susan M. Gordon is the former Principal Deputy Director of national intelligence serving from 2017 to 2019, where she advised the president on intelligence matters and provided operational leadership of the 17 agencies and organizations of the intelligence community. Ms. Gordon is currently a Rubenstein Fellow here at Duke University, and she holds a Bachelor's of Science from Duke University, where she was a three-time captain of the Duke women's basketball team. So please join me in welcoming Sue Gordon. Sue, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh, and Sue, I'm so sorry. I think we've got you on mute. There we go. I think we were confused between whether I was muting myself or the host. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Um, what a great time <laughs> for your program. It's like we're in a lab <laughs> seeing it every day. Um, and uh, I just, I can't wait to, uh, to mostly uh, hear from uh, the participants and answer some questions because we'll see what we, we can create together. 
Oh, yes. So thank you so much. And please, everyone, don't hesitate to put any questions that you have for Sue in the chat function because we will turn to them shortly. So Sue, to kick things off, I wonder, you know, you know, you were formerly the second highest ranking intelligence official in the United States. Can you give us a little sense of what your work has looked like and what kind of responsibilities you've had as a leader in national security? So what's interesting about it is um, I started out just to get a job. So I was an undergraduate at Duke. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go get my PhD in biomechanics or go to law school. So I thought I'd get a job and I, joined the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, I come from a family of public servants, so it was a natural thing to do. And, and what's interesting, and I'll, I'll do a quick run through my job history, how you get to the top, but what I would tell everyone is the way you get there is by, by being good at each level, uh, focusing your energy where you are, but keeping your head up a little bit to see how what you're doing applies to the larger goals of the organization. So my leadership journey was, um, uh, I wanted to lead. And what I would tell everybody is when your vision exceeds the resources that you personally possess, you have to lead. There's just no way. It's just something that is in you. It isn't about power. It isn't about um, domain. It really is about what you want to achieve. So I started out being, by being a branch chief, um, a first line supervisor, um, that is really just about taking your expertise and teaching other people how to do what you did. And then I just moved through the organization, um, not just being an expert uh, in Soviet weaponry, that's how I started, but actually becoming good at the craft of intelligence. And if you are always trying to achieve something, and if you were making that achievement be related to the world around you, it turns out that people, that it's a pretty rare skill and you'll have a chance to do things. And along the way, I became the person that you hired if you wanted to do something different. If you had a problem you needed to solve, I was the person. So when the Central Intelligence Agency couldn't figure out how to get to Silicon Valley for their technology, they said, Sue, come up with a way to do that. And my idea was we'd ask a group of private citizens to form a venture capital organization focused on our toughest problems, but um, using uh, Silicon Valley to provide the solutions. Um, when our support organization was spending too much money and we needed to take resources out of how we did the, issue, the areas of um, finance and HR and facilities, um, but we needed to spend 10% less. They hired me uh, to figure out how to do it and get 10% less. So I became the person that could do anything that you needed to do without holding on to what I preferred. So I got to do cyber and I got to do IT and I got to do geospatial intelligence. And at the end of all of that, you keep on getting more and more jobs till you arrive at the point that I did in the end where you get the chance to guide the whole organization. And then the last thing I'll say is when you have a career of ascendant leadership, you're on your own journey where you start out being good at something and teaching that. And as you move up the chain, as you have more resources, your job becomes first more of guiding the accomplishment of a mission, guiding people to be able to do things and ultimately having influence much more than direct power. And so it's, a, it's an interesting journey um, to travel. Um, and the government, interestingly, is much more about, really, about achievement than pedigree. I love this. So Sue, can I stay on this topic of journey just a little bit? And I'd love to hear a little bit, you know, from, from you about your perspective as a Duke alumna. You know, how did your experience at Duke, your Duke education shape your development as a leader? Well, when I'm being glib, what I say is that Duke gave me the three most important things in my life. And that is Duke taught me how to think and to be insatiably, insatiably curious. Um, Duke 
taught me how to uh, have a group of people upon whom I depended and who depended on me, my teammates when I played basketball. And they also, Duke also gave me the love of my life. Um, but when I go back to how to think, and, and now is a moment where the world is so different that we aren't gonna be able to draft off the work of our predecessors. We're going to have to create a new. And this notion of being able to think, be a critical thinker, being able to wonder about things, being able to let go from how you used to do it to imagine being able to do it differently but still accomplish, I think is the most critical skill. I would also say this critical thinking will help us in a world of, of so much information that we can't distinguish true from untrue. And while I think technology will come to help us, and while we have pundits who would like to tell us the best skill to have in this world is to be able to be critical consumer of information. And Duke taught me that. I loved that Duke did put so many requirements on me as a student. You know, back in 1980, you had to take your major courses, then you had to take four courses in a secondary field and two courses in another. So I was in science, then you had to do, I chose four in social sciences and then two in humanities. I just packed my schedule with the non-major courses. So I took religion courses and history courses and English courses. And I will tell you that those probably benefited me as much as any of the direct discipline courses that I took. So mm -hmm. everything I am, Duke gave me, except that stuff that my parents gave me. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Sue. So, you know, I'm really curious about your leadership philosophy. Do you have one? Uh, I think I would probably say um, two things is you have to be good as an individual. Um, you have to, when you're a leader, your craft is leadership and you have to be good at that. Um, it, nothing can happen if you aren't sound yourself, if you don't understand your strengths and weaknesses, if you don't understand your skills, if you aren't acquiring skills to be able to do your job, nothing works if you don't have that. And then once you have that, none of that is the point of leadership. Leadership is all about outcome. Leadership is all about where you need to take your women and men or your organization. Leadership is 100% about being so committed to what you've been asked to do, to so believe that you're supposed to, fit, to handle the task at hand, that you will give away every personal preference to be able to accomplish that. So it's like you have to hold two ideas in your head at, at one time. It's all about outcome, that's all that matters, and you have to be sound. But if you mix the two, your women and men will not follow you because they will recognize that you are hedging to protect yourself for some outcome. So mine is know the outcome, sell out for it, but you have to be good enough to be able to deliver. Mm. I love that. So I'm thinking about, you know, examples of, of good enough or, or great leaders. Are there any that stick out for you, you know, maybe even role models or people you would point to as inspirational leaders or even moments of excellent leadership that stand out for you? Yeah, two come to mind. That's a great question. Um, and I might come up with a third vodka. The first one, I was, I was young. I was probably in my 20s. I had been given a huge task to do, um, to come up with a brand new way of collecting information clandestinely that had never been done before. And they gave me a bunch of money, a bunch of responsibility, and I was all smug. And I came up with, with a team with a great solution. And just as I was about to present it, everything went wrong. The customer for it just obliterated me because I hadn't been smart enough to handle the politics of the moment. I had been casual with the people that were on my team and they had committed 
well beyond my ability to deliver. It was an awful day. It was, it was devastating because I wasn't good enough and I had let people down by appearing to be good enough. And I went to my boss and I told him how badly it went. And I will never forget. He said, ah, I've seen worse. And in that moment, I decided two things. One, I'd better be better and understand the whole of my job. And the second, I wanted to be a leader that could always say to their subordinates, I've seen worse. Because his ability actually allowed me to be really aggressive. When he didn't need to micromanage me so much that I couldn't come up with a new idea, when it went horribly wrong, he just went, I've seen worse. And then his skill came in and I learned how to be better. So that, that was one. Um, the second is the woman that preceded me into uh, my last job as a principal deputy, a woman named Stephanie O'Sullivan, who actually had been junior to me. We had promoted her into senior ranks. And when we promoted her into the senior ranks, everyone's like, you know, she's going to run the place. And darned if she didn't run the place. But she was someone who was so quiet did not need to exert her will. Much like the other boss I had, however, was so good that you knew if you could get your solution through her, it was gonna go somewhere. And she just, I remember a day she called me into her office and she said, Sue, do you know what your job is? And I said, well, I, I think so. And I said, it's actually she said, Okay, good. Um, I, good. That is what your job is. It's just I was hearing that some people didn't know what their job was, so I wanted to check. And I thought, God, what a great way to go, right? She didn't, we didn't spend an hour. She just thought she'd check in. She said, Do you know your job and whatever? So I have had bosses that gave me great responsibility that did not try and tell me how to do it, but were so good at their domain that I got the benefit without the burden of them. And I, and I think that allowed me to grow and probably carried me through all the way to the end of my career. I am sure there were times when I was talking, actually, I'm sorry, as I was talking, there is a moment when your confidence becomes not in your boss, but actually in your subordinates. And, and I'm known as a risk taker, I'm pretty bold, let's go, let's go take that hill. And people say, how can you be that way? Um, one is bosses that allowed me to do it, but, but over time it became, I knew my women and men wouldn't let me down. In other words, if I could set a mark, they would get us there. And so this understanding your job, how far you can go, understanding your role, which one you are, really has been the lessons that were taught me and I've tried to give back to the people um, that I've had the good fortune to lead. So it sounds to me, you know, just to, if I can sort of piggyback off of this idea, to be a, a great leader and inspiring leader means that you have a certain type of relationship with your team. And I'm wondering, Sue, like, how do you build an effective team and inspire an effective team to do those great things? Uh, um, so first thing, first, um, you have to be authentic. I know, I know this is almost a hackney phrase now. Everyone talks about authenticity. You do have to be true because the truth has its own sound. And I've known people with a whole bunch of different leadership styles. You can be gruff, you can be brash, you can be shy, you can be aggressive, you can be compassionate. Um, but you have to be true. So the first thing is I have always been exactly who I am. Um, two, I have always understood my responsibility. Three, I think when you lead, you do have a responsibility to, to set a star. So we're going this way. And then what you have to do is say, and we can get there and then put the weight on others. I tend to be an inspirational leader and people tend to believe me because they know that when I want to go somewhere, it's not for me. 
and people will forgive you any error if they know it was an error of attempt rather than an error of protection. But when people believe you, and this is probably playing out politically now too, when people believe you, you must be doubly sure that you can deliver because if people give you their hearts, not just their effort, and you let them down, it is far worse than if you were someone they didn't have respect for and you let them down. So interestingly, for my young leaders out there, it is wonderful when people will follow and people will come with you. But understand that the reason why people are cynical is they wanna protect. If you tell them they don't have to protect themselves and then you don't take care of them, it's not just that they'll lose faith in you, they'll lose faith in the organization and really bad things happen when that goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sue, what would you say is the biggest misconception about leadership? Uh, that it's about power. Um, it's my, I, I think it's about responsibility and opportunity. Um, it, there's, there's, there's nothing, power is an illusion. Um, well, I guess for some people, power is the point. For me, outcome is the point. And power is only about, can you hold your space? Can you use the ground that you have in order to achieve that? So um, it's way too hard to be about power, but it is about opportunity and responsibility. Um, I always said that in my organization, everything that did or didn't happen was my responsibility. And my job was to create the opportunity for good things to happen. So just don't be thinking it's about power or wealth or, or anything. It's really about opportunity to go somewhere. And when your women and men do something, God, that's the best. You know, you put on your proud face. So, you know, you all know that I lost my job. Well, some people may know that I, I, uh, I was the principal deputy of national intelligence when the director of national intelligence um, uh, was asked to leave. Um, the president also decided that he didn't want me to ascend to that job. And so I ended up resigning. Um, but but the, my resignation letter was really written for my people. I, I said, the women and men of the intelligence community will never let you down. They are the nation's strength. And I really meant it because if I had held on to just my position, it would have undermined this notion of where the strength comes from. And leaders understand that they have responsibility to harness that strength, but the strength is really not theirs. And to me, that's kind of the key to successful leadership. I love that. So, you know, we're in the wake of an election, a lot of us are thinking about leadership um, perhaps more than normal because we're thinking about the responsibilities and, and the tasks that face us in the coming years, especially as we grapple with challenges like COVID-19 and um, you know, Black Lives Matter and just so many challenges and, and issues that we are grappling with as a nation. And Sue, I'm wondering, you know, based on your leadership experience and your career, the lessons you've learned, what advice might you give to leaders, um, say specifically government leaders at the federal, state, local level, as they look toward the next few years? Um, so a couple of things. One, I'd offer some perspective. Uh, I think there is so much good news in this election. Um, I am so proud of America. I, put aside the choice we made, we turned out in record numbers. Our citizens embraced the moment and believed that they had responsibility for choice. And that is absolutely amazing and wonderful. And we actually protected our election infrastructure um, regardless of the noise and the things that are going on right now to ensure that there was no fraud, the election infrastructure was protected so that people could be confident that when they went to choose, they could choose. 
And then finally, look at us. We may be having a pretty serious conversation. But you know, the sun comes up, we go do our jobs, we say hello to our neighbors. And I think there's a lot of fundamental goodness in this moment. But there's also a reality, and that is one, this world has changed so much that there are so many things that just aren't working the way they used to. And I don't care who it is that takes on leadership or in every level of America, we're gonna have to figure out how to do things differently. We're gonna have to figure out how to live in a world where half of the people in this country believe antithetically differently than you do. And instead of thinking that they're wrong, rather think about, no, how are we gonna lead this great country? We have so many things of social unrest, economic difficulty, political unrest going on, but view that as an opportunity because finally we're vibrating and it's being seen. Let's not recover to a simpler time where we don't see it. Let's see it and then do something about it. And then internationally, this is going on as well. The whole nature of geopolitics and partnership and how interconnected we are has been shown by COVID. So what I would say is see the moment clearly for what it is. Recognize the challenges we have. Don't try and recover to the past. We have to build to the future, but do so from this foundation of America still believes in the experiment we have. We just know we're not good enough. So I say embrace the moment where we can see our failings, recognize what that we need to do something, but use this foundation that our systems are still largely intact and our people still believe. And I think if we can harness those things too without being Pollyannish or without devolving into the hyperbole of partisanship, I think there's great opportunity to find a way forward. So I love that so much, Sue. And, and I have to ask you, thinking about moving forward, there has been some speculation in the news that uh, we might see Sue Gordon in the Biden administration. Um, is there any news that we, we might be the first to hear on this Zoom call, Sue? Oh, you won't hear it from, from me because um, uh, Vice President Biden is still picking his team. Here's what I would tell you. And I, and I kind of challenge everyone on the call. If the president asked you to serve, would you serve? Yes. Right? And if, and if you say no to that, then you have to ask yourself, what is that? So if president-elect if president Biden came and said, Sue would like you to, to serve, I, I don't think there's a way in the world that I would say no. And if he chose some of the other candidates that I also heard the name, they would have no better partner than me in helping the nation um, be secure, um, be secure in a modern way, um, and to reestablish our position globally because, man, the world needs some leadership too. I love that. And, and Sue, can I ask, you know, if we're thinking about in terms of national security issues that should be on our radar, things we should be thinking about that our leaders should be thinking about, are there any that you would pinpoint? Well, uh, number one, we have got to address the issues of trust and truth. Um, you know, it's an, it's an information world where all the threats and opportunities are two or three information. Information are, is abundant, but it isn't very well managed, um, put to use. We're not the integrity of it. So one of my first would be on trust and truth. I think we have to deal with the national security challenges of climate, of immigration, um, of pandemics, and all the transnational issues um, that have not typically been inside the national security tent, but have been outside that. But as we learned with COVID, holy smokes, we're connected. Um, the third thing uh, I think is really we have to get past this partisanship that is keeping us from taking on the things we need to as a nation. Like I said, Half of America believes differently from the other half, and it's not casual. And so figuring out how we can actually govern, I'd probably strengthen our institutions because 
they're not corrupt, but they aren't nearly good enough for the moment. Uh, and then I'd work on, on our allies and partners um, because there's just no way that we go through this world alone. Hmm. That's great. So Sue, I, and I also wanted to just mention to the audience, if you have questions for Sue, please do feel free to drop them in the chat and we will turn to them in just a few moments. But I wanna ask you for a little advice for our students, for the emerging leaders, or you know, those of us who are in careers and thinking about leadership at different phases. You know, what, what advice would you give for people who are looking to lean into, you know, for lack of a better phrase, their roles as leaders or, or to really um, take on new leadership opportunities? Uh, one, leadership is awesome. Like I said, because it can transport you and inspire you and support you. And there are so many different um, enablers that leadership affords. Um, if you want to learn to be a leader, if you aspire to that, probably the one thing you most have to learn how to do is make a decision. Uh, you know, every decision requires making a leap. You're gonna create something that has never been existed before. And that's scary um, because there's an amount of uncertainty in there. And people talk about being risk averse. I think we're decision averse. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people would rather wet, let the world turn. Let's wait and see. And here's how you know, they say, let's wait and see. Let's get some more advice. Let's do some more studies. And all that waiting in a world that is moving so fast is keeping us from actively affecting our course. So you want to be a leader, learn how to make a decision. And my tip for that is um, <laughs> make the decision, see if you can bear the consequence of being wrong. If you can, go ahead and go. If you can't, you need to do some more work. My example is for me, if a decision, if it went wrong, would cost me a million dollars, who cares? I can get a million dollars. If it would cost me 10 lives, I'm probably not ready to make the decision. So learn to be a decision maker. Believe that you're supposed to do something. If you don't believe that you're supposed to do things, how is anyone gonna come with you? Give away everything you have if it will help the cause. Give away responsibility to the people beneath you and then cover them. Work with your partners if they need your help. Give away stuff. You know leadership can be fundamentally unselfish if you focus on the outcome. And then I think probably the last one is, um, you'll, every leader I know at some point has to draw a line in the sand um, where you just can't go. Um, what I would say is don't be shy about that, but never be casual about it. Um, Cause you're gonna draw that line in the sand and it's gonna cost you something. You don't get to determine what the cost is. You just get to determine the action. So know where the line is don't be afraid to draw it but don't be casual about it and we could go on and on there's so many great leadership lessons but the first one is believe the second one is learn how to decide and the third one is ah, i lied if they're not following you're not leading mm. one of the mistakes a lot of leaders make is they get so focused on their leadership style and their leadership aims that they forget to look around and see whether anyone's coming with them. Hmm. Your style isn't as nearly as important as whether people are coming with you. Oh. Thank you so much for those, those insights, those words of wisdom, Sue. And we have a number of questions in the chat here. So I'm gonna turn first to a question from Kate Lucas. And Kate says, I know that you've been working with tech, com tech companies in the private sector to help them better understand the role that they play in protecting our national security. How's that going? Do they get it? How do leaders with a public platform better communicate the role that citizens and private organizations play in helping to keep us safe. Yeah, Kate, one, you can see me, just hearing your name makes me smile. Um, so what Kate's talking about is in 2020, um, decision makers about national security are not exclusively in the government, right? And our adversaries and competitors when they attack us are not just attacking the government. And so that means that our companies have got to understand one, the threats that they face and two, the responsibility that they have. 
I think it's coming along. I do. I think cybersecurity, we still have distance to travel, but I think cybersecurity and companies, people are understanding whether it is healthcare, understanding the risks that they, that ransomware poses to them. And so they have to invest in securing their systems differently than they used to, um, or whether it's companies protecting their intellectual property so that we don't we lose global leadership. Um, but I think the best example of why I'm so hopeful is actually the issue of disinformation. You know, five years ago, the social media companies, you know, were felt no responsibility, it seemed. They had created a product that would allow people to connect, but they weren't really taking responsibility for how that could be used badly. And in this election, you see them beginning to take responsibility for what happens on their platform. Now, I'm not sure that they have it right yet in terms of what you can censor, what you don't, what you flag, but I love the notion that they're actually taking some responsibility. So I think we're coming along. What I would say is companies are ready, more ready to take responsibility than the government knows how to give it to them right now. So I think there's probably some work the government needs to do to be able to give more guidance to or leeway for companies to step into this space. I think we're coming along. I do. Second question for you, Sue, is from Maisha Brown. And the question is, what does restoration of hope in leadership look like after moral devastation? What are the necessary characteristics? Yeah, I think, I think I mentioned it is, is you probably have to have three things. One, you have to have clarity about your responsibility and learn the craft. So um, leadership isn't about having the position and being able to tell people what they can do just because you can. You know, not everything you can do should you do. And so step one is you have to demonstrate that you understand the circumstance in which you find yourself and the responsibility of your words and your actions for dealing with that. And the higher you go in leadership, the more you're yelling, so you, the more responsible you are. All right. When you, I talk about being a branch chief, you know, I was a leader, but my voice was like a little bit of a whisper. Once I got to the top of the intelligence community, if I whispered, it was a yell. And so I think the beginning of restoration is an understanding of the circumstance, clear-eyed, and then your responsibility. I think the second element is um, the notion of, we, there are so many hackneyed leadership phrases that come along. Servant leader is one of them. But I do think servant leadership is a really important concept. And I think that's gonna have to bear out again. And that is, who are you serving, right? Are you willing to suffer any consequence for yourself in furtherance of the mission and the people you serve? And then the third one, and this is gonna be hard for us right now. Um, we can't just talk about the problems we have. We can't just be nice. We can't just say happy things to each other. We really do have some issues that have to be addressed. And bad news bears, when you decide to solve problems, not everyone is going to agree, but you have to be good enough to know that it's focused on the outcome. So the third piece is actual achievement, actually doing things, not just talking about things. 2020, we can't just talk about it anymore. So what actions are we going to take? And are you going to be good enough to be able to propose those actions? And are you going to be true enough to be able to get a coalition of people to come with you, even if the action you're proposing is not the one they prefer, but can you get them to come with it? So those, those three are probably easy day. Restoration will be easy because remember what I said, more people voted 76% of those eligible to vote voted, not only did they want to have a say, but they believed that there was something worth participating in. 
So you take the three steps I said, you understand you had that foundation, and then you just do the freaking hard work that it's going to take because these are tough times. Indeed, they are. So a question about institutions. Um, someone asks, can we set job criteria for congressmen, senators, and the president of the U.S.? Well, I think they... <laughs> So what I love about the Constitution is that our Constitution purposely limits the power of government. Right? That's what that's what it does. You know, we're a revolutionary people here. We we describe what the government couldn't do, um, and so I I think you're always going to be stuck. So I think the Constitution has designed the rules. Um, I think what's happened over time is that people have taken those and crafted them. Um, to their advantage rather than to collective advantage. Who you vote into office? How do you hold them responsible? How do you exert your will? And again, this is one of the reasons why I'm hopeful about America right now is we're exerting our will. And you had to be holding a rock over your head to not hear the voice of America saying that the leadership needs to be better. Now we just need to put leaders in who are going to be better. Um, the one thing I will offer though, is when you select leaders, what the constitution doesn't say is that there's any guarantee that the leader has to be right. In other words, it isn't unconstitutional if the leader does something that isn't the right thing to do. And so I think we're going to have to also, as a people, understand that, that there are limits to how much everything that is done to solve a problem can be exactly how we would have it done. And we can't run every person out of an office who doesn't do it as we would prefer. And I actually think that's what the split population tells us, hmm. is if you don't inspire some trust in the populace. So DeAndre, your question to me before was, what do you need? How do you restore it? Or the question was, how do you get restored? It? The first one is you have to restore some trust. Because I don't know how, if people don't trust you, they're ever gonna allow you to do something different from what they would think could be done. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the greatest difference over my 40 years in government service is when I started, we kind of accepted that with each election, we would have a different philosophy of what the right approach to solve America's issues or to advance America's interests was. Mm. Something happened over the years where if it wasn't what I prefer, it was wrong. And we're gonna have to have some leaders who can reestablish the trust that will allow us to do that. Mm. That's great. So this question is from Brandon Horning. And Brandon, it says, not to have a pessimistic view, um, but a professor once told me in undergrad that American citizens began losing faith in politics since the Nixon administration with high political participation during the election, but misinformation at an all time high and someone in office who places on the, I'm cleaning the swamp of uh, of corrupt politicians' identity, how can, corrupt, how can current politicians and future politicians better invest the citizenship and restore faith in the democratic process? Yeah, I, that's a great question, Brendan. And actually something I've always said is that I thought, I thought Richard Nixon started the downfall because before him, we kind of thought politicians were crooks, but we didn't know it. And, and mm -hmm. that, was laid bare, some of our idealism and willingness to come along was eroded. I think we've had an erosion of trust before President Trump. Um, some of the stuff that happened with um, Edward Snowden and questions about uh, were all the government's actions and uh, proper when it came to chasing bad guys and were we protecting US privacy and those kinds of questions. So we've been losing trust um, along the way. I kind of, I don't know if you all do this, but I played along with the debates and, and questions that I wanted, wanted to ask the candidates. And the question I would have asked um, Vice President Biden would have been, put yourself in 2016 
imagine that you were being challenged as the election might not be legitimate because you might have gotten help um, from the Russians. What would have been your reaction to that? What would you have said to the American people? Because here's what I wish our president would have said. Hmm. We cannot have foreign interference in our elections. I will make it my absolute number one responsibility to get to the bottom of what happened. And if it turns out that the vote was not legitimate, we'll deal with that when it comes, but my responsibility is to you. I would have, that's what I want my leaders to say, mm -hmm. is that I believe so much in my responsibility to you that in prosecuting my responsibility, if it costs me everything, I'll be okay. So I think that's the standard that we need to have restored is do they understand that it, it isn't protecting themselves, but it's about protecting our institutions. Demanding our institutions are better because trust me, our institutions aren't good enough right now, but protecting our institutions, protecting our democracy, even if it costs you everything, do the right thing, even if it costs you. And I think that's what we need to see. So I, I guess, Brandon, I can be pessimistic too, because we've seen a, de a degradation in that over time. But this feels to me one of those moments where the American people have been pretty clear about this if you listen to them. Um, and if we'll hold our leaders' feet to the fire, if we'll keep on using our voice to vote, I think we can restore it um, because we just, it feels far away, but my sense is it's not that far away. So this next question is from my friend and colleague, Catherine Adme. And Catherine asks, can you say a little about our exposure to threat during the tra this transition slash non-transition time? Are we sending a signal to, signal to our enemies that this is a good time to make some gains against US ability to protect Americans and others when our Secretary of State says that we will make a seamless transition, transition to a second Trump administration and when Biden has no access to daily security briefings? So thank you so much, Adney, for that question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, so I'm a career intelligence officer, so I look at foreign threats during when we knew that our adversaries were looking at our elections as something they wanted to see if they could influence, I tried to make it clear that what they were trying to do was to undermine our belief in ourselves. And if we started not believing in ourselves, that we would actually do our adversaries bidding for them. So all this talk about fraud, corruption, rigging, all that, that is, absolutely creating an opening. It is absolutely irresponsible it, it, from a national perspective. If there has been fraud, let's go find it. But to talk about it in the terms is absolutely ir irresponsible. Second, our seamless, peaceful transition of power has been our strength. What that says is that we believe more in our system than we believe in the individual. If we are undermining that, we have now created an opening for people to say, oh, now we know how to attack them. The idea that we aren't engaging in the transition as we normally would, that we aren't providing briefings. Again, if you wanna know where the threat lies, the threat isn't in providing briefings to the president-elect, the threat is in not providing briefings. And then finally, if we as a nation are distracted, turning against ourselves, this is a great opportunistic time for our adversaries and competitors. So again, my hope is, and my sense is, that the system will kick in, that by January, this will all sort out, that the women and men below the leadership level know how to do their job. Remember how I said, part of my ability to take risks because I trusted those below me. So there are a lot of people every day making the system work, even in this. But what we're doing right now, if I'm an adversary or competitor, I'm kicking back going, <laughs> I don't have to work very hard because they're doing it themselves. But I think 
And I think you can see, you're seeing some senators leaping into the fray, actually saying some things. You're seeing some of the hyperbole damn down. I think we'll get there, um, but boy, we'd have better stay vigilant. And you ought to thank the careerists who are creating this stability while we're figuring out how to get the politicians all in order. So this next question is from Julia Suba. And Julia asks, how has your experience in the intelligence community been shaped by the faith that you're a woman? What specific advice would you give women who want to work in the intelligence community? Um, probably the same I said before is uh, know who you are, be who you are, performance matters. Um, early on, I spent no time paying any attention to anything other than being good. And uh, trust me, in 1980, um, there were some really fascinating environmental things, things that are said to you, things you do. But when you're, when you're starting to focus on, on being good, because I wish the system cared about you, it doesn't. The system cares about getting things done. And if you're the person that can take them somewhere, you're gonna be just fine. It gets more complex the more senior you get. There is still bias, conscious and unconscious. Uh, there are still clubs that, that don't have people have gray hair, gray long hair in them. But I would say that's when you have to really double down on your networks, uh, use influence more. You still have to be good. Um, your little feelings will get hurt by things that are said along the way. Go back home, get, let your feelings be hurt, and then come back into the fray. And just remember seriously about this. No organization, no entity has enough en energy to stop someone who does, right? And then when you get in a position of power, you know, when you get in leadership positions, then fix the damn system, right? Fix, fix it so that no one has to choose between pursuing the career they want and being treated dis differently. Choose different people, have a different view of who you bring. So you have to have this kind of duality of, as an individual, succeed anyway. As a leader, fix the system and use the power you have to stop some of the goofy stuff that still goes on. Next question from Allison. Cassier, um, Allison asks, can you talk more about the middle ground of leadership, where you're moving from worker B to leading your colleagues, but you're not yet near the top? Is there anything you would advise doing or avoiding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that transition is really hard. I didn't, I didn't do it particularly well uh, because I took my standard as an individual and then when I first became a leader, I applied that standard to everybody else. That's wrong, right? It wasn't up to me to make them all like me. I was responsible for overall achievement, but you had to let people be, have responsibility on their own and then you stand and you're accountable for the overall achievement. So that's a big transition between what your standard is as an individual and not putting everyone into your, into your mold. Um, I, I think the other thing that I tried to do um, at, at that point was how do I say this? I tried not to hold so tight. It, it's funny. You would, you would think that, that the higher you get, the more control you would have. I found the higher you get, the more you need to, to back up. So as you're in that middle, you've got to learn how to let go of some control um, that you have. I, 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 leading in the middle, is the best. It's, it's where you have the most impact, um, but it is all about how you learn to set a course, but rely on the strength of your people 
And I don't know how to tell you to do that, except to tell you that you must, um, because if you're the one that is defining everything, your organization will never be better than you are. If you just set an aim point and then open it up, you have just created the space for innovation and it's really exciting, but that's a hard transition to make because you want to be good and you're, you're actually putting the goodness in someone else's hands. So Sue, if I might, I know we have you for just a few more seconds before we wrap up tonight's session, but I have to ask you, I mean, I'm so inspired by your hope and, and your, your positive energy. You radiate that positive energy. And I just wonder, how do you stay so hopeful? What keeps you going in that vein? Uh, I, I just, we've been in, we've been in the soup before. I think, I think part of it comes from having seen incredibly difficult circumstance overcome by will and effort. Um, and I think the other thing is, so I'll, uh, do I have one minute for a quick story? Um, when I was the director of support at the CIA, uh, it was a, my tenure, we lost eight CIA officers overseas. And now if you're in the military, I don't know how you bear the numbers of losses that they bear as a, as a leader. Eight was a lot for us. And I made sure that I always went um, out and met their planes at Dover. And these young families would be there on the worst night of their lives having their loved one come back in a flag draped coffin. And I would always go and talk to them and they would be grief struck. I mean, unimaginable, because they were always young, always had young families and they would be grief struck and racked with tears. And I'd be trying to comfort them. And sometimes somewhere in the middle, they would start comforting me and trying to tell me that their loved one wanted to be there and they were doing what they loved and doing what they appreciated. And in those moments, I think what I saw is the real strength of individuals. So me, what I see is amazing desire, will, ability, passion, energy, just waiting to be turned loose or focused or be asked to solve these things. And I've seen it done before. I've seen it done in unimaginable times. If you were old like me, we, we had duck and cover drills when we were six years old in elementary school because we thought that there was gonna be a thermonuclear blast. And none of the people on this call did that. But man, in the 60s, we thought that that was real. And when the planes fl flew in to the towers, in New York. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And now we don't think that's going to happen all the time. We can solve it because of the strength I see in our humans and the resolve I've seen when we've been in crisis. We just have to take this one on. And I'm so honored to be in front of you all. And I hope I've given you a little bit of a lift thinking that there's a point to what you're doing. That whether you go into the private sector or whether you go into the government, whether you go into politics or whether you go into an institution, there is a place that we need to go. And in each of those domains, there is the opportunity to chart a course. And people are clamoring for leadership right now because it seems so uncertain. But if you can look historically, we know what to do with uncertainty. We've done it throughout our history. Well, Sue, I, I can't thank you enough for being with us tonight, for sharing so many valuable, all of your valuable insights about leadership with us. I'm feeling inspired. I'm feeling hopeful as we move forward. And I know that all of our audience, um, everyone with us tonight is feeling the same way. So thank you so, so much for being with us, Sue. Thank you. Love your program. Love you. Thanks, Matt.
Thanks, all. Thanks, Lila. Thank you. And so everyone, I just want to say thank you for being with us tonight. We know there are many things you could be doing with your, your Friday evening, and we're so honored and grateful that you chose to spend it learning with us. Uh, I want to offer just a few quick thanks to uh, the Polis home team, particularly Professor Mac McCorkle, Director of Polis, uh, Morena Martinez, our amazing Polis PhD fellow who organized tonight's event, our Polis Directors Fellows who were staffing our event, Caroline Kasser and Jessica on, as well as the entire Directors Fellows team, to Anna Kinnear, our program coordinator, to all of you for being with us, and especially to the Honorable Sue Gordon. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everybody.